happen. Let's start with this this, this morning. Well, let's say this together. Good morning. Good morning. And then I love this. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Ah, that's Feliz good. Uh, Feliz Navidad. There you go. Man, we are multilingual today. We're going for it. Uh, let's have some fun this morning. If you have a Bible, would you take that out? Let's be in God's Word this morning as it is focused on the Advent season. We're headed there, and uh, I'm excited about all that's happening. If I could just uh, get my iPad to open, that would be awesome. Uh, if you're using the app, if you're using the app, it's there for you and uh, Harvest Church Sela. And uh, by the way, I didn't say that. I forgot to say, if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'd love to give you one. If you need one for a friend, you're saying, I'm looking for a stocking stuffer. It better be a big stocking because that Bible's, <laughs> yeah, ready to jump in there. Uh, today, the message is called this, a sparkling joy, a sparkling joy. We are in this series called Light Has Come. That comes right out of John chapter 3, verse 19. And it says, light has come. The light, the light, the light of heaven. That is Jesus specifically. And I, I love that. And I, I want us to think about, we are in a uh, Right now, this is a fun time of year. This is actually a very uh, intense, could be an intense week for you. Let me think about this week that is coming up. This week, this week is the week that all the schools, all the schools, all of the schools in our valley uh, will be on break for the Christmas holiday or winter break, uh, whatever you want to say there. We're going to say the Christmas holiday. Uh, this is the week when Amazon and Costco will buy for your last minute dollars and they want to be crowned the king of Christmas. So uh, whatever way you go, Amazon or Costco, this is the week. It is the darkest week of the year. Uh, in fact, I was out uh, yesterday trying to get a walk in with our dogs and I'm like, we got to leave like at by noon because it's going to be, <laughs> you know, we got to get that in. Uh, this week is the winter solstice. You can see that it's going to be the 22nd this year. Uh, this is the week, um, by the way, this, is, well, this one's not as much fun. This is a week when many people lose their joy. What? Many people are exhausted. Many people are overwhelmed by the holiday season. And it hits about this week. They were like all ready to go for it from Thanksgiving on. And now like, are we there yet? How, anybody? Fit? No, I'm not going to even show it. Raise a hand. Uh, if you're saying, hey, I am there. And you say, well, that was a depressing last point, Jason. That was not, uh, that was a dark turn right there. Actually, today we want to talk about not losing your joy, having real joy, not just at Christmas time, but yes, at Christmas time. And so uh, I want you to think about this. We sing words like this, joy to the world. Joy is serious business. Joy is serious business for Christians. Christians ought to be, and I just want you to hear this, Christians ought to be the people who carry joy like a bright lantern. We ought to carry it like a bright lantern into the darkness, but sometimes we need help. Anybody know that? We need help sometimes because we can get exhausted and we can get weary and we can lose sight of it because it's about Amazon and Costco and all of the other things about finishing the school uh, season off. And you're like, do we have to go five more days? No, we don't. Uh, there we go. We can get there. I want to give you a definition for joy that's going to help us today. This is out of the Unger's Bible Dictionary. You're saying, I need a Bible dictionary in my life. Unger's Bible Dictionary. There you go. I want to give you this definition. Be ready for it. Joy, joy is a delight of the mind arising from the consideration of a present, that means right now, or assured possession of a future good. Let me read that again. Joy is a delight of the mind arising from the consideration of a present or assured possession of a future good. I have joy either by what I have in my possession right now or future possession, and it's assured. I have joy because... It's already handled. It's already done. All the gifts are wrapped. All the things have been prepared. Everything is ready. Joy is this delight of the mind. And I'm going to give you a couple of uh, ways joy is expressed. Joy can be expressed in a number of ways. Here it is. When moderate, when it's just kind of like, hey, just a normal day, just an everyday, average day, it's July. When moderate, it is called gladness. When raised suddenly, like uh, this, is, this is sudden and great and amazing, uh, this just happened, suddenly to the highest degree, it is exaltation. And you can see this, sometimes you can see this at uh, a sporting event when people are like, yeah, 
exaltation. You can see this when you're at a concert, when you got tickets to Taylor Swift, and you're like, oh, I am a Swifty. I didn't want anybody to know, but now you know, and I'm here. Exaltation. There you go. Some of you are like, wow, that was weird. Uh, <laughs> when our desires are limited by our possessions, joy can be known as contentment. Contentment. When high desires are accomplished, it brings, and this is a great place to be, satisfaction. We have arrived. What, what we set out to do, we did. It, it, it's satisfying. And then this one, when opposition is defeated, we call it triumph. All of those ways of expressing joy. Let me just give you, again, when moderate, it's called gladness. When raised suddenly, it's uh, exaltation. When our desires are limited by possessions, contentment. When high desires are accomplished, satisfaction. When opposition defeated, we call it triumph. And I love that because when we understand what joy means, it's not just like, oh, every day I just have a big smile on my face. Ah, that's probably not. That's, uh, that might be uh, something else going on there. Uh, this is where we talk about joy. But I, I, I know this. When we talk about joy, sometimes it's better just to show you some joyful pictures because pictures are worth a thousand words. And so I want to I wanna give you a couple of pictures today of joy. Let's put that first one up there. Ah, that's a good one. Uh, if you've ever received a present, you've received a present, something you've been longing for, doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to be nice, but you've wanted this for a long time and you received it. Ah, joy, joy. Uh, that's, that's great. In fact, let's do this right now because uh, sometimes it gets really serious and I want us to uh, have joy today. Uh, somebody, uh, you have to have two seconds to think about this. What is a great gift you received as a child? Tell somebody around you a great gift you received as a child and go. A great gift you received as a child. <laughs> That was a great gift. You loved it. Somebody gave it to you. And oh, man, what a great memory that established. A great gift. How about this one? An another picture for you of joy. Let's show that next picture of joy. Oh, I like this one. Yeah, there she is. Uh, and it's saying, darkest time of the year. Uh, the beauty when light overcomes the darkness. And I would tell you this. There's something about, especially at the darkest time of the year, that's one of the great things about Christmas time. Uh, some people ask, uh, ask me, and they say, Jason, was Jesus born on December 25th? Likely no, but we celebrate it for very clear reasons at this time of year, and we could talk about that, and I'd love to tell you some of the history of why we celebrate Christ's birth, but one of the great things we get to talk about is light has come into the darkness. Light has come into the darkness. And so here's this, the beauty of light that overcomes the darkness. I want you to then interact with this. I want you to think about what is your favorite kind of Christmas light? What's your favorite kind of Christmas light color? What is the size of bulb that you like? And uh, what's the wattage on that bulb? Tell somebody around you. Tell somebody around you. Size, color, wattage, you got it. So good, so good. As you think about those Christmas lights, some of you like blinking lights, some of you like colored lights, some of you like just the white lights, some of you like, I like the blue, blue light. I like that. And uh, let's show you another picture of joy expressed in a picture. Let's show you this one. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, that is so good. That's so good. Something that, th this girl, what you don't know is she is headed toward a cliff and she believes she can fly. <laughs> Like, I'm going to clear it. I'm going to clear it. And what, actually, when I saw this picture, I'm like, she started out on a tube, like up at White Pass. She started on a tube, and she's like, I don't need that. 
I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. All right, this is where you get to tell somebody around you what is a fun wintertime activity that you enjoy or have enjoyed in the past. Fun wintertime activity, something you enjoy, enjoyed in the past. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, all right. Whether you like uh, ice skating or you like hockey or you like, uh, man, you like sledding, you like snowballs, you like being inside watching a movie, um, you got it. Here's the fun part. I, I want you to think about this. Did anybody see that all three of these pictures had some things in common? Uh, there was smiling. There was smiling. Every one of those uh, little kiddos had a smile. They were happy, or at least they seemed to be happy in the moment. Uh, that's good. And did you notice that, that every one of them were female? Did you notice that? Anybody else? That's intentional because I wanted to, you to see this because today it will lead us right into a passage where we have two famous women in the Bible who are filled with joy. They're filled with joy because of the arrival of Jesus has brought them joy. Two famous women, we're going to get there. We will meet Elizabeth. She's an older woman. That's trying to say that in a, a gentle way. Uh, she is six months pregnant with her first child, and that child will be known later in life as John. Anybody? the Baptist. That is Elizabeth's child. And so we will meet Elizabeth. And then we will meet Mary. She's a young woman who is early in her first trimester with her first child who will be called Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited one. These two women filled with joy because of the advent, the arrival of Jesus. Two women, think about this, two women carrying two little boys. Remember, there's no ultrasound. There's no ultrasound. In fact, Mary wouldn't even qualify. You're too soon. You're too early in your pregnancy. You, we, we can't, the ultrasound wouldn't even work for you. This passage, by the way, uh, that we're going to look at, and if you're wondering, where are we going in the Bible today? If you have your Bible, you can go to Luke chapter 1. Uh, that's where we're going to be today. Luke chapter 1, second half of your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and we'll be there. The passage that we're going to look at is surrounded by controversy. It was uh, when it was penned, and it was uh, when it happened, it was surrounded by controversy, and there's still controversy today. One, we have an older woman who has passed her childbearing years, but yet now she's pregnant, and many might uh, have said in her community, oh, you know this, you know, that this is, they, they say this in hushed tones, oh, that's irresponsible, don't you think? That's irresponsible. You know, she probably, she may not even make it through labor. I, oh, man. Poor Elizabeth. Wonderful for her, but not great. So there's controversy for Elizabeth. Then there's this young woman, betrothed but not married. Many would say, mm, oh, so irresponsible, so irresponsible. And someone even crossed the bridge and said, just, that's just immoral. I can't believe, oh, Mary, just, oh. And so there's controversy surrounding these two women. And that's why I'm saying joy doesn't need there to be a lack of controversy, a lack of, uh, it doesn't need perfection in every circumstance. But I was thinking about this. In our day and age, there has arisen another controversy that would surround this very scene we'll see in Luke chapter 1, two women with two little boys in womb in utero, uh, surrounding gender, surrounding gender. The, there would be another controversy regarding, by the way, this is a rather new controversy in this way. And uh, I've heard even on the news again this week, I heard on the news again this week, very intelligent people, people who are very sharp, very sharp in many ways, but they were stumbling over gender again. They were stumbling over, is there a way to define a uh, woman, uh, define a woman? And uh, you, you, if you paid attention to this, it's in the NCAA everywhere. It's in, it's in uh, uh, courtrooms, it's in Congress, it's all across the fruited plain that this question, this controversy, uh, in light of these two women, amazing women, Elizabeth and Mary, uh, I thought, you know what, as they carry these baby boys, uh, I might just try to give a little light in the darkness. And so I wanted to be clear in my own heart, could I define and be able to say, I know, I know, I know. Is there a definition for a woman? Here we go. This is my uh, feeble attempt. I'm not putting it on the screen for you because it's not gospel. Um, but I, I, this is my, my attempt at it. Here it is. Uh, definition. A human adult female intentionally and beautifully created in the image of God 
wonderfully bearing the distinct double X chromosome to the very cellular level. That's my first attempt. Uh, that's my first attempt. Here it is. A human adult female intentionally and beautifully created in the image of God, wonderfully bearing the distinct double X chromosome to the cellular level. Very much these two women will be filled with joy by the arrival of the Savior. And so let's look at it. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. These two women both of them, one older, past childbearing years, and yet six months pregnant. One, very young, and in the first trimester, here they are. Verse 39 of Luke chapter 1, here's what it says. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste, let that sink in, into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, probably breaking all of OSHA's standards. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Has anybody heard that phrase before? Very famous phrase. Blessed are you among women, exclaimed by Elizabeth, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She knows some things. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. There is a lot happening in this joy-filled passage. And let's remind ourselves of what we are doing together today as we open God's word. This is God's word for us. Amen? Amen? As we do this, there is joy that is meant to spill from the page and into your life. It is not meant to be contained. It's not meant to be kept over in a, in a, in a shoebox and put up on a shelf. You are meant to receive the joy that this passage is bringing to us from these two beautiful women, Elizabeth and Mary. And I want you to catch, the first thing that you would catch is there's a pace that it begins with. It says this, with haste. Maybe you've heard this statement. Haste makes, anybody? Haste, haste makes waste. Like it's, a, 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 and many times haste is, is looked down upon, but Mary got up with haste after hearing from the angel Gabriel that she would carry the Savior and she takes off. Very, very, uh, it says, with haste. That means, man, there wasn't a lot of prep. There wasn't a lot of time. There wasn't a lot of discussion. She is going. Not wasting a minute, this young woman, Mary, departs to see her much older cousin, Elizabeth. You say, well, why did she have to go see Elizabeth? Why Elizabeth? Why would she go there? It is because the angel Gabriel, and you can read about this in Luke chapter 1 before we got to this passage, the angel Gabriel has revealed to Mary that, what is impossible for man is not impossible for God. In fact, he references nothing is impossible for God, and he references here Elizabeth, who was barren, unable to conceive all of her life, and now she is in her sixth month. She is well into her pregnancy. She is well uh, uh, moving into the, 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 we, what we hope is the safer stage of her pregnancy. Mary enters the house. I love this. She hastily comes in. The baby leaps in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. There is so much going on here. And then some spectacular supernatural stuff. Elizabeth exclaims in that loud cry, and she declares some things that she could not know on her own. One, uh, she had no way of knowing truly that Mary was going to arrive and when Mary was going to arrive and that Mary would arrive with baby on board. And so she knows all of a sudden, she knows Mary's pregnant. Mary is so early in her trimester, she's not even showing. No, nobody would know that Mary's pregnant, but Elizabeth knows and she knows the gender of Mary's child and she knows this, that Mary is carrying the Lord. 
She's carrying the Savior. She's carrying the Messiah. She is declaring, exclaiming the identity of Mary's child. And it is so supernatural that she would know all of these things just by hearing, Hello? Hello, it's Mary. Elizabeth, are you home? At that, Elizabeth shares, and is, and what she shares is so particular it's clear that the Lord has revealed some things to her. And I love that. It says she was filled with the Holy Spirit. She has ability to know things she couldn't know. The Lord is filling in some details for her. And then he speaks through her. I want to give you something that Mary and Elizabeth both received. And that is joy. I want to give you the main point today. There's just one big main point. There's some things that, that hold up that main point, but I want you to get this. Here's the main point today. If you're a note taker, please get that. If you're taking notes on the app, it's there for you. The main point today is this Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the long-awaited one, Jesus the Christ. Jesus brings joy to the world. The news is so fresh for Mary, the news is so fresh for Elizabeth, and yet we see multiple people receiving joy right in this passage. In fact, I was looking at this passage, and I thought, what, what would we rename this passage? Maybe we would call it two women, two women, and two little boys. No, oh, that doesn't roll right. That doesn't go well. What, what should we say? Maybe it's just simply, Jesus brings joy to the world. Jesus brings joy to the Mary. Jesus brings joy to Elizabeth. Jesus even brought joy. This is, this is the great, great and crazy part. He brought joy to John the Baptist in the womb. There's something amazing going on here. And if Jesus can do all of that, we need to understand this, that Jesus is meant to bring us joy too. Jesus is meant to bring us joy. In fact, I want you to think about this. If you know someone who has encountered Jesus, and Jesus has brought joy into their life. He has changed them. He has made them different. He is changing them, maybe even to today. Jesus has brought joy to them. I want you to think of their name. Maybe they're a friend. Maybe they're a relative. Maybe they're the person who introduced you to Jesus. Maybe they're that person. And I, I want you to be ready to say their name out loud because Jesus didn't just come to bring joy to Mary and Elizabeth, though he did. He came to bring joy to us. And so I'm going to read this. I'm going to say it like this, and we'll, we'll put it up on the screen. Uh, that I'll say, Jesus brings joy to, and I want you just to say a friend or a relative. They could be in this room. They could be thousands of miles away. They could have already passed into eternity, and you know them, and they know Jesus. And you just say their name out loud. Are you ready for that? You ready? If you're ready, say ready. Okay, you're saying the name of a friend or relative that Jesus has brought joy to them, like Elizabeth, like Mary. Here we go. I'll say this. Jesus brings joy to, say their name. That was weird, wasn't it? You're like, no, 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 no. Jesus brings joy to Larry and Bob, Susan. I'm just pulling out great names, just, just out of a hat. You know the names of people who truly have encountered Jesus, and Jesus has brought joy to them. Maybe they have lived through some hard things, but they had joy. They had contentment. They had gladness. They had satisfaction. They had these things because of Jesus. Now, I want you to make it more personal. Jesus' arrival is meant to bring joy to, and this is your name, by the way. And it's weird sometimes when you say your name, when you say your own name, if I say, Jesus brought joy to Jason, and I'm like, wow, oh, that's weird. I never refer to myself like that. But this morning, I want us to just understand and make it very personal that Jesus' arrival wasn't just to bring joy to Mary and wasn't just to bring joy to Elizabeth and John, but he was meant to bring joy to you. So you get to fill your name in the blank here, all right? Here he is. Uh, I'll read the first part. You just fill in your name, but you got to say it louder like it's actually a good thing, all right? <laughs> Here it is. Uh, I'll read the first part. You, you just fill in your name. Jesus' arrival is meant to bring joy to? Jason. All right. You're like, I know my name. It's a good day. Now listen, I pray that understanding who Jesus is, not was, I pray that understanding who Jesus is 
does bring you joy and will bring you joy. Greater than that, knowing this, putting your faith in Jesus not only brings you joy, but it brings forgiveness of sin. It brings new life. It brings eternal life right now. It brings hope. It brings peace. It brings so much. There is something about knowing Jesus. You say, how do I know Jesus? Just confessing, Jesus, I know who you are. You're God in the flesh. You came for me. You lived the perfect life I couldn't live. You died on the cross in my place. I believe that. You were buried for three days. I believe that. You rose again to give me new life. I believe that. And I want to follow you. There it is, that confession. That confession of the heart says, you're a Christian. You're a citizen of heaven. You're part of the family of God. This is who you are. And there's joy because Jesus said, I came for you. I came for you. Now watch uh, this supernatural joy that Elizabeth and the in utero John, uh, the Baptist, uh, that, that joy spills back because Elizabeth is like, I know who you're carrying. I know what, what is it that brings the mother of my Lord into my home? What does that? So Elizabeth pours out this joy, and then Mary responds. And I want you to read uh, with me. It's this beautiful, uh, many people believe that uh, she sang it, that she quoted it, that she was poetic, that, that it definitely got written down. And here is Mary responding with Elizabeth and John the Baptist with joy. Verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. It says this, And Mary said... And Mary said, my soul magnifies. You might circle that in your Bible. That's an important word. Magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. 48, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is where Mary says, I, I, I didn't expect that that interchange when I entered the home of Elizabeth, but I can't not respond to it. I, I must respond to that. And I love how uh, Mary responds in such a personal way. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. In fact, uh, you might have this uh, in your Bible, might have a little note that says this. Uh, mine says, Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat, the Magnificat. That is because that word is the Latin. It's used right here for magnify. My soul magnifies, magnificat. It means I want, th this is a focus. This is something that needs to be uh, looked at and looked at intently, magnificat. In fact, here's the Latin version of Luke 146. It says this. Magnifica anima mia dominum. My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. Her desire here was to magnify the Lord and not herself. She is not praising herself in any way. She's saying, Mary received joy. Jesus' arrival brought Mary joy. And she said, and it doesn't just stop with me. She used this phrase, in fact, maybe you noticed it. When there's a phrase used over and over again, it's meant to get our attention. In this passage, she uses this word, these words, he has, he has, he has done this, he has done this, he has done this, he has. And if you have the old English version, it would say he hath, he hath, uh, he hath done this, he has, he has done these things. And I want you to see as Mary's song, as she as she declares, maybe that's the best way to say it, it is a declaration. Whether or not she had a beautiful singing voice, it does not say. 
but she has a great understanding and she has great joy. And so it begins with these three things. What God did for Mary is number one. She's going to begin with that very personal. And I want you to just hear as she declares joy based on who God is, on who Jesus is in her womb, she is celebrating with Elizabeth and John. She says this, he, he is my savior. He is my savior. And then I love these words. Look at verse 48. It says this, for he has looked on the humble estate. He has looked at me and chosen me. He has looked at me and he's chosen me. I don't know if you've ever had some of the playground politics that happen in elementary school, but I'm going to tell you, uh, in my elementary school, there were playground politics whenever kickball came up. And uh, sometimes they would be choosing teams and somebody would look at you like, not you. <laughs> Have you ever had that? <laughs> You're like, oh man, you looked at me. You looked at me. She says, he has looked on the humble estate of his servant and chosen me. She might be saying this, I, I wouldn't have chosen me, but you did. You looked on my humble estate and you've chosen. He is my savior. He has looked and chosen me. He is mighty. There's something about the power of the Lord, joy hooked to the power of the Lord, that, that is, means that joy, huh, it, it doesn't fade. That joy is, is lasting. And I love when she says this, he has done great things for me. Not because I deserve it, but because of who he is. He has done great things for me. And then she ends with this. <clears throat> His name is holy. His name is holy. Glory to God in the highest. That's what the angels will declare in months following this interaction. And I love, as we read the Magnificat, Mary is not exalting herself. That's how our world does it. Mary is not exalting herself. She is fixed on the king who has all the power. She does not have the power, but the joy is found when you receive the blessing of heaven instead of trying to make heaven bend to you. That is true today. Right now in this exhausting season for many, that you would receive joy instead of trying to make heaven bend to your will, you bend to the will of heaven. That's what Mary did when she said, let it be done to me. Let it be done to me, as the angel has said. And I love this. What God did for Mary. And now number two, she's gonna, she said, I, I can't stop there because it's not just about me. It is her. She is totally in this. She is in this for the rest of her life not just for the duration of the pregnancy. Number two is this, what God did for us. And you can see how uh, she breaks it down. Now, I don't think she had like, I'm going to structure this and I'm going to make sure it has three different movements and in, the, in this poetic way. I think she's just saying, I've got to exclaim some things just like Elizabeth exclaimed and proclaimed some things. She's saying, I've, I've got to get this declared. What God did for us is number two. She doesn't just leave it about her. She's saying, God is doing something mighty in our world. Verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. The first thing is that you would see this, what God did for us. This should give you joy. His mercy is extended to all those who fear him. And not, not fear him like, uh, I'm scared of you and I, I want to run away from you. She's saying, all those who honor him, all those who respect him, all those who recognize who he is. His mercy is extended to so many people, generation to generation. God's mercy pours out. His mercy is extended to all those who fear him, all those who come and recognize saying, you're the king and I'm not. You're the authority and I'm not. You're the one who is to be worshiped and not me. What God did for us. His mercy is extended to those who fear him generation after generation. And then let's just kind of walk through this where he, uh, she literally gives us so much truth here. He has shown strength with his arm. That is a great 
and very Old Testament way of saying he has all the power and he has extended his power with his arm, with his righteous right hand is another way to say it. He has extended himself. He has reached out. He has shown his strength. What could not be done and what we experience here, the virgin birth, let alone the miraculous uh, pregnancy of Elizabeth, he has extended his strength. He has shown he can do whatever he wants to do. And then she moves into this. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. That tells you he knows it almost sounds like Santa for a moment. What you're thinking. He sees you. He knows this. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the mighty. He has exalted the humble. And she's saying, listen, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve what God has given to me, but he's given it to me. And then these two last ones, I, I love this. He has filled the hungry. He has sent the rich away empty. And I'm going to tell you, after going through the, the Beatitudes in my life group this, this fall, these words had just so much, uh, they were so rich, so, so overflowing. As we hear Jesus in his adult years proclaim these very truths that Mary is proclaiming right here. He has filled the hungry with good things. And I'm not ta talking about just food. Those who are hunger, hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Uh, you need to know this. God is not against uh, He's not against monetary wealth. He's not against it. But so many people who have any level of monetary wealth, and by the way, in the world standards, we are all ridiculously wealthy. In our world standards today, we are, and so many people put their faith and hope in their wealth, what they can do, their ability, that they miss Jesus. They miss Jesus. He has sent the rich away empty. If that's where your faith is, that will never, never satisfy you. In fact, think about Jesus as he had this, this conversation, hard conversation with a young man. In fact, many people, commentators call him the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, I've, I've done everything perfectly. What else do I need to do? And Jesus said, sell everything. Come and follow me. Sell it all. Come and follow me. Did you see that he extended that to a wealthy person? Come and follow me. The same way he would to somebody who had nothing. Come and follow me. He has sent the rich away empty. Mary is declaring this in the Magnificat. He has filled the hungry. He has sent the rich away empty. This is where we see Mary understands that the coming of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus would bring joy, but would turn the world upside down turning everything upside down. The weak dethrone the mighty. The humble scatter the proud. The nobodies of our world are exalted. The hungry are filled. The rich end up poor. Jesus' coming wasn't just another day on the calendar. Jesus is that, his coming is the center point of history. The, the grace that he brings into the world system makes no sense to the world. The church enters in and we say, only because of Jesus, only because of Jesus, do we get to gather and say, our future is bright. Our future is secure. We have so much. Mary is just declaring this. Who gets to hear it? Elizabeth, John the Baptist in the womb. And Mary, that's all we know of that, that are there. We don't know if Zachariah's in the next room saying, man, that was good. That was good. That preaches right there. Somebody should write that down. And Luke will. Luke writes it down because Luke, as we understand it, Luke writes it down as he interviews. More than likely, he's interviewing Mary. And that's how he gets this. That's how he understands it. It's those eyewitness accounts that Luke uh, uh, is giving to us. 
And so she declares, what God did for Mary, he brought joy. What God did for us, he brought joy and he turn, he's turning the world upside down. And then she ends with this, because don't miss this, what God did for Israel. Verses 54 and 55, Mary is Jewish. I don't think we have, our world has thought so much about Jewish people as a whole as it has in the last few months. But it is, it is uh, a topic that is across the lips of people in many countries right now. Who does the land belong to? It belongs to God. The land belongs to God. Who does the land belong to? Is there value? I, in fact, I'll tell you this, just my own personal, I, I have been rattled by seeing how much anti-Semitism has risen, risen so quickly. And my, my, my thought is, has that been there the whole time? What makes people hate the Jewish people? Why, why are they so easily, and I'm going to tell you, I believe it is because they are God's chosen people, and he has plans for them, and his plans will prevail. Look at verses 54 and 55. He has helped his servant Israel, the Jewish people, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, and she names the original patriarch here, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. God made some promises to Abraham. He promised land, he promised to make their name great, and he promised to bless the whole world through him. There's some specific promises. And here is Mary. She's saying, this is God coming through on his promises to my people. He has helped his servant Israel. He has helped his servant Israel just as he said. In fact, I want you to hear these words. He shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. The nation of Israel, even today, don't think of them as godly, God-honoring people. But you need to understand this. When God makes a promise, he will keep it. That's good news for us, amen? amen. When we understand that, Mary is saying, he's done great things for me. He's gonna do great things for us. And included in us, is he's going to do great things for his people, Israel. He's going to come through and do what he said he would do. And Mary is declaring that, bringing us joy. Today, we want to, want to think about this joy as that bright lamp in a dark place. A bright lamp, every Christian should be filled with joy. And that doesn't mean, oh, nothing phases me, lots of stuff touches our lives just like everybody else but we should be people who have the gladness of heaven the contentment of heaven the satisfaction of heaven we should experience all of the things that we know about joy that because we have in our present possession and future possession a relationship with the God of the universe who came for us. I want you to think about Luke chapter one, these verses we've read. Three people got to respond to the good news. These two amazing women, Elizabeth and Mary, and then this other amazing thing that happens there, John, who is leaping and dancing in the womb. That must have been uncomfortable. <laughs> He's leaping and dancing in the womb. These three respond to the good news. These three rejoiced over the good news. And you say, well, what am I supposed to do with that? We are meant to join them. We're meant to join them. As you hear that Jesus came for us, he came for us, it should bring you joy. No matter what's happening in the world today, no matter what's happened in your week this past week, Jesus is saying, I came for you. I looked at you like I looked at Mary and I chose you. I looked at you 
and I wanted you on my team. Playground, politics, we're done with that. I looked at you, and now it's your turn. I want to just uh, praise the Lord, and then I would want to invite you to sing for joy today. Let's sing along with Mary and Elizabeth and baby John. And so would you do this right now? Would you just stand with me right where you're at? I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Don't just listen to me pray. And so that we might be ready to declare we have been waiting for you, Jesus. And you always come through. Would you pray with me? Would you extend a hand and let's pray? Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the Messiah, Jesus. In the name of the Savior, which is Jesus. In the name of the Anointed One, which is Jesus. The name above every name, which is Jesus. And we join with Elizabeth, and we join with John, and we join with Mary, and we join in to this good news, and we rejoice because you came just as you said you would. Thank you for coming for us. Lord, I pray for anyone who has not put their faith in you yet that today would be the day that they would begin to walk with you as a follower, having you be their king, having you be their savior, having you be their Lord. Lord, I pray that today we would be able to rejoice for eternity because you're still changing lives. Change us. lift up together the strong name of Jesus and we rejoice. Amen? Amen. Let's sing for joy.